Today I'm joined by Susie Ballock. Susie is a double Olympian, Olympic champion 2004, Commonwealth champion 2006, and the first Australian lady shooter to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. Welcome, Susie. Thanks, Christian. Susie, how did you get into shooting? Um, oh, it was a family thing. My dad clay target shot, but it goes back further than that. My grandfather in Hungary, he clay target shot and hunted. And when they arrived in Australia, they took up the sport. As a kid, I got dragged around and, you know, got to see all the clay target ranges in Australia with dad and mum. And eventually I had to go. And I loved it. Cool. I saw your dad or your family came to Australia in 1956. Is that correct? Yeah, so they were um, refugees during the Hungarian Revo Revolution, um, fled into Austria and then landed in Darwin in Australia to the warm weather and then ended up down in Victoria in a refugee camp called Bonagilla, which is a um, very, very cold place. Okay. No, I know there are a few, um, few Hungarians that were on the Olympic team and went to the Melbourne Olympics and didn't go back. So I was wondering whether they were part of that. I know. <laughs> okay. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? I had two, I suppose. Um, one was my campaign for the 2004 Olympics. The I qualified for the Olympic team. A month later, we had a World Cup test event here in Sydney. And about five minutes before that test event, um, I actually injured my back. I had niggling back pain, had a massage treatment and physio the night before, again that morning. And then I was on the warm-up layout and I basically had my ammo in my pockets, gun over my shoulders, and I just went to stretch out. And what happened was I severely did two discs in my back and sprawled on the ground and had a trip to hospital. So having worked so very, very hard to get into the Olympic team and then it's snatched away from you, um, that was pretty tough. But I managed to um, basically learn how to walk again how to shoot again and did absolutely everything I could to get to Athens six months later. And I think because I'd hit rock bottom and was on the upward trend, um, my shooting was just improving and improving. And the other good thing is I had no expectations on myself. It was just purely process and performance and follow that on the day and came away with a gold medal. And then the other one that was, also a dark, dark moment for me was uh, getting ready for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. I wanted to go and defend a gold medal. I'd, I was ranked number three in the world, number one in Australia at the time. And what had happened was um, the selection process had changed partway through the year and my world rankings didn't count anymore and my overseas performances and it was purely a domestic selection event and there were four events i won all four but they actually just took our score before final and the last two events i had glandular fever so i missed out on going to the beijing olympics by two targets and i was distraught i changed my world around for this i'd put four years hard work in i'd um retired from my position with the Government Agriculture Board and um, I was distressed, distraught. My hair fell out. Oh, I, was, I was a mess, a total mess. And that's probably been the lowest mental place I've ever been. Um, but it got me to learn to be resilient and to fight back again. And I moved to Sydney, closer to a range and managed to go to the London Olympics. Cool. What was your best moment? Ah, um, winning gold, of course. I mean, the lead up to it had been tough. Um, I was really fortunate to be a, a filler for the Sydney Olympics. I'd only been shooting the Olympic disciplines a couple of years and I got asked to come along and make up numbers. 
However, I wasn't an Olympian. I wasn't part of the team. I wasn't even a volunteer. And on the scoreboard, it actually said no name, no country. And so for me to see this brilliant score that could have got me in the finals, with no name, no country next to it, was the start of me going, I really want to be an Olympian. I want a name. I want a country. So I put in the hard work for four years. I lived four hours from a training venue. So every weekend I would jump in the car and go to the training venue. And I used every penny I had, every bit of holiday time, everything to get there. And I'd had the back injury and I also found out the day that I had made the Olympic team that my mother was um, going through breast cancer. So, I mean, that's a high and a low for you in one day. That was pretty massive. Had the back injury and then fought my way back. So the proudest, the best moment for me was having got into the final and realised that the final was over. The first emotion you kind of get is relief, then a little bit of excitement. But then the best moment is when I looked at that scoreboard and I had a name, I had a country, and I also had Olympic champion under it. And that is satisfaction. So all the hard work pays out. Yeah, and it comes full circle, right? Before that, four years earlier, you don't you see no name, no country, and then you see your name and your country. Really yeah. cool. Um, you said earlier you had no expectations going into the Olympics, but then in the process you must have seen, okay, it's going well. Did you at some point say, okay, now my goal is to get a medal? Um, I always believed I could get a medal. I'm, I'm someone who puts in the hard work and I don't go to an event just to be a competitor. I go to an event to be a contender. And I knew that, you know, I was capable of a gold medal. But you just, you stick to your process. Like, I've learned now that, yes, you can dream. You can say, I want to be Olympic champion. But that's, that's an outcome goal. That's not always in your hands. And an example of that would be um, the London Olympics. I shot a personal best at the London Olympics, a new national record, I broke the old Olympic record in qualifying as well. And then Jessica Rossi from Italy just had the day of all days and, you know, only missed one target in the final. That was it for the day. So I had hit every goal, every process I had gone through, but yet, you know, the outcome still wasn't a medal for me. So I think sometimes... Um, outcome goals are really dangerous because they're often in someone else's hands as well, whereas process and performance goals, they're, they're yours. You can deal with them. Yeah, I believe that. Unfortunately, very often we get measured by outcome goals. Huh? Absolutely. But also athletes, you know, they want to perform their best too. And, yep, that happened. <laughs> yeah. One thing that piqued my interest, you said that moment when you looked at the scoreboard and it says no name, no country, you said, okay, I made a decision. What did you change from that point onward? Okay, I'd only um, been thinking of myself as a part-time shooter. I'd only been on the Olympic circuit for two years. I was still working a full-time job and it was more of a hobby for me. And I kind of fit shooting in around my job. And I'd still be, you know, going to weddings and birthday parties and enjoying myself. And it was there and then that I actually went, okay, I need to become a professional athlete and put the effort in. Unfortunately, uh, shooting in my days was not a very heavily funded sport. So I still worked full-time jobs to fund the sport. Um, but it just changed from me thinking this is just something that I do that I'm good at to I want to be the best. Yeah, professionalism. If you could travel back in time 10, 15, 20 years, what advice would you give a younger Susie? Uh, to dream big 
and make sure I have a picture of it. I've, I've learned so much about visualization and if you can see it, you can do it. I also think that sometimes because we don't know what's out there, we don't ask enough, we don't dream enough, we don't plan for it. So I think I'd be telling myself, find out of other people what they would have wanted to do 20 years before, what advice they had. Mm. And then also have a look at the people that are at the top of their game and say, where would you like to be? And maybe dream and go for that. So that would be the advice to myself. Dream big and, and make it realistic. Yeah. I really like the advice of going to people who have already been there. So that this kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. Really cool. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and or person? Um, okay. So I suppose I'm not really someone who analyzes themselves very much. I'm, I'm someone who'll shoot a target, think of it for two, three seconds and then move on. And that's kind of a handy skill to have because you're not dwelling on the past. You're trying to always move forward and progress. So that's a habit I've formed. The other habit that I think is a skill as well is compartmentalization. I was really good and am really good at focusing at the task at hand. So if my cat had died that morning, when I was on the tracks competing, I was on the tracks competing. So being in the present. Um, I think also I'm not afraid of hard work and I will put it in, put the hard work in. And one of the habits, unfortunately, is that I've been to the top of the sport, the middle of my sport, and also the very bottom. I've been in teams and then been deselected from teams to give younger athletes a go. And you just have to learn resilience and that fight to come back. And I have almost made it a habit to be as resilient as I can, to fight as hard as I can and have grit. Um, yeah, so I suppose it's a habit, way of life, move on, get over it. How do you do that with the resiliency and grit? Yeah, I, I think um, some people don't take challenges head on and they don't take opportunities because they're afraid of failure or they are worried that, you know, it might not work out the way they want. Whereas I'm someone who just gives it a go and if it doesn't work out, then I've learnt from it. Hmm. Also, life throws things at you and sport throws things at you and you could just retire or you know find another sport or move on but to actually dig deep and you know have to face everyone again and get in there and fight then you know that's how you do it just keep turning up and coming back for it yeah And you mentioned it earlier in this interview, and I've also seen it when, heard it when I made my research. You traveled four hours to your training location? Yeah, Australia is a big place. Um, <laughs> For sure. Not many Olympic trap layouts throughout the country. Um, so I was stationed in a town four hours west of Sydney, and my work was state-based, so I traveled a lot. So for every year for about 10 years, I would average about 120,000 kilometers in a car, plus flying as well. So I did a lot of travel. Um, but what it meant was that when I actually got to the range, I would put the effort in. It wasn't slacking off. It wasn't. Um, just hanging out and seeing how practice went. Every session was planned and I made sure that, that I got the most out of every session just because of the sheer effort to do it. But also what really stood me in good stead, particularly for Athens, was that I trained in some pretty horrible environments. So 
it would be hailing or snowing or windy or 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. But if I got there at the range, I was going to stick it out. And when I got to Athens, it was crazy windy. And I'm one of these shooters that um, competes about the same level in really good conditions as I do in bad conditions. However, there are almost like you'd call them fair weather shooters that shoot well in perfect conditions but really struggle in poor conditions. So I got to Athens, crazy hot, crazy windy, bring it on. I was happy. Yeah. I think that traveling four hours to your training location is also a very good example of the grit you're showing and the commitment to your sport. Yes. Do you have a morning routine? Um, well, these days, sleep in as long as I can. Um, but I, I still do have a basic morning routine where I lay in bed for about five minutes and I think about what I've planned to achieve that day or what I want to achieve. And then the first thing I do after that is make my bed. Number one goal achieved for the day. So that's an easy one. Um, Competition-wise, I used to have a, a pre-competition routine the night before and then a routine in the morning. And you could almost liken it to going on a mission. I, I made sure that all my kit was packed, ready to go, And then I was prepped, so I made sure that I was hydrated, that I had taken care of any injuries, gone to sleep, woke up, and then basically did stretches, checked my kit, and then did whatever I needed to do um, to get ready. So the morning routine shooting was always the same. The most um, interesting routine I had was probably the night before, I love to take long baths and read trashy novels. Um, And iron my clothes. I'm not really a big ironer, but it's just that odd moment with an ironing board where there's just me doing the most mundane task and it's just running through things in my head and just bringing me back to, to ground. So I suppose my routine at night would be to center me and then these days i carry that into the morning of just making my bed and thinking what i've got to do for the day really cool how do you prepare yourself for important moments wow um it's pretty much like i just said those those plans i i kind of think of my shooting or important moments um again like being on a mission so at night i'd be checking my gun my guns maintained and it's put away for the night in the morning you get your gun out you put your gun together and it is like game on mission on so as i go out onto the tracks i try and listen to some music with like a big march in it and head out there as if i'm ready and focused to go when i'm actually just about to pull the trigger so it's all about closing my gun and again it's that game on it's the only bit of equipment you always take out with you you might forget shells or your glasses but as soon as that gun closes it's just like zero in be present focus and that's when the big moments happen is in that that split second where i'm letting my eyes focus and I'm just wanting to see that target and latch onto that target. And for a shooter, that's the big moment for a clay target shooter. So I just make sure that I'm present and I'm ready to commit. Yeah. I mentioned to you earlier before, we, before that interview that I worked with our national shooting squad and we got a chance to try shooting. And it is really amazing how even though you think you are concentrating, how much your thingy moves, right? So what I really want to say, your sport is somewhat unique in the way that for your performance, you have to calm yourself down. Most other sports have to hype themselves up. How do you Um, do that? I'm, I'm the opposite. So 
rifle and pistol is calm yourself down. Some clay target shooters like to be calm, but on a scale of zero to 10, zero is where you're dead, 10 is you're so scared you're pooing your pants. I like to be so physically stressed, I'm in that eight or nine where my heart rate is maxing out. Okay. I become more focused. My vision improves. My reflexes improves. Um, I'm able to just be at the task at hand and be present. And if you think about it, it's the whole um, caveman being attacked by a bear and you can either run away, you can stay and fight, or you can freeze. Well, I'm not going to freeze because I'd get eaten. I'm not that fast, so I can't really run away. So I'm a stay and fight girl. And I, I have a science degree and I am aware of what physical stress does to the body and what the signs are and how it can help you. I mean, our bodies are designed to take on that bear or run away from that bear. And in that moment when I am, you know, in an Olympic final, my heart rate is maxing out, but I'm cool with my knees knocking. I'm cool with the sweaty palms or, um, you know, the butterflies in my tummy because I know that makes me perform better. I'm sharper and more able to. So um, I actually try and hype myself up. In okay. my Athens, not in my Athens, in my London final, I... Um, I'd been quite sick. I'd been in quarantine for a couple of days before my event and I'd been on a drip and a few things and I, it was a tough day. Every time I went out to shoot, it just poured. I packed four sets of clothes and by the time the final came round, the only set of clothes I had left was my, my backup, backup, backup plan. So I ended up looking like a big green monster in the London photos. Um, but... The finals was delayed a little and it just, I was kind of really strung out. I depleted of energy and focus between shooting a perfect 25 in my last round to waiting for the final and then heading out for the final. And I was just flat. I couldn't get elevated at all. It was, it was really sad because I would have been working on a, probably a two or three. So I would, a rifle shooter would have loved my heart rate but I like to be up the other end and I'm comfortable up the other end. So, yeah, it's little, little nuances in the sport. I think of rifle and pistol shooting, um, it's a stationary target, whereas clay target shooting is like serving in tennis with the court moving or a free mm. shot in basketball with the hoop moving. But the other thing I can liken it to is the start of, say, a 100-metre sprint race or a 50 meter swimming race and you're on the blocks and you're just ready to launch, clay target shooting is doing that, you know, 125 plus 50 times a day. And just the adrenaline and the focus, the being ready, ready for that target to come out is really, really draining. Yeah, okay. One question that stands out, at least it stands out for me, in the military and in the police, they also have the special forces, the snipers. Do sport shooters make good snipers or is it a completely different skill? Um, we actually, in Australia, there was a young shooter that I was in Athens with who was a 50 meter prone and 3P rifle shooter for Australia. And... He is actually now in our special forces as a sniper. Okay. So the skills are transferable. Yeah. Okay. How do you overcome setbacks? Ah, oh, gosh. I learn from my mistakes and I try to find a workaround. Um, I suppose I, I think of things or not only skills but experiences like um, are you familiar with Mary Poppins with the umbrella and she's got the big carpet bag and she pulls things out of the carpet bag? It's a Disneyland yeah, type I know. story. So I kind of think of myself like Mary Poppins, that I've got this big carpet bag and inside there, you could probably call it your toolkit, inside there I have the experiences I've had, whether they've been negative or positive, and 
from them, I try and learn from something from them. Also, you put all these tools in there as well that can help you get over setbacks and maybe help you get on the way. So I, if I've had a setback, I want to try and find a workaround. So what that means is if I can't do it one way, I want to do it another way. But in my um, career, some of the setbacks have been where I've actually uh, shot the score to qualify and twice I've been taken out of the team, um, once for a World Championships and once for a Commonwealth Games to um, a junior shooter that they wanted to blood to, to get experience. And um, the way I dealt with them was basically it's like waving a red rag at a bull. It's like, well, you didn't let me go to the Delhi Commonwealth Games. I'll be going to London and I'll be shooting well. And so it's just this, it gives you a fire in the belly. So um, I harness it and it fuels, fuels my, my challenge and what I'm trying to do. So setbacks, we learn from them. If we don't make mistakes, if we don't have setbacks, how do we grow? How do we learn? Yeah, good point. Who's your role model and why? <laughs> um, my mum and her tennis ladies. <laughs> Sounds interesting. So my mum, she's 80 this year, and she has been playing tennis with the same group of ladies every Thursday morning for 56 years. And these ladies... Um, my mum used to play very high level tennis and badminton and they just all love to turn up. They're hugely competitive. They um, really want to perform their best. They don't like to lose, but they all just are happy to turn up on a day it's raining and have a cup of tea together. And it shows me that you can be competitive against someone and yourself but still support each other and have wonderful camaraderie and these ladies are the backbone of the community that i grew up in and they're still playing tennis if they can so i think that they are actually my role models hmm. cool what is the best advice you received and who gave it to you uh, the best advice was from my father um, dad, being a refugee, was not an educated man at all. He doesn't read and write. And he had this saying to us, it's mind over matter, mind over matter. And he said that you can do whatever you want to do if you put your mind to it. And I think he, he really liked Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. the karate dude. And we had this book which, as kids, I, I still remember it, it had like um, karate exercises and moves in it. And I, I can't do a, you know, a crazy knuckle handstandy thing that he can. But, you know, we'd want to do those things as kids and we'd try them. And I did judo for a while, but um, he said it was mind over matter. If you want to do it, you'll work out a way to do it. And it's pretty much the best advice I've had. He used to hold us by the ankles so we could do those those knuckle those knuckle push-ups. And it it kind of showed me that with help and support from people, you can you can get by. So I I really learned that the mind is really powerful. And if I want to hit a target, I can hit a target. Really cool. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Okay, so I, I would have had two um, key times in my life that I can look back at training. One was when I traveled the four hours. So um, I work all week, jump in the car Friday afternoon, drive to Sydney, and I'd probably do some night shooting or some late afternoon shooting. So 
I'd be getting bulk training in, just trying to get some targets under my belt because I haven't been able to train for five days. And then that night I'd stay on a friend's floor or lounge or spare room. I had lots of friends in Sydney and I, you know, stay at a different house every weekend I was training. So thank you, people. And then Saturday I would do a little bit more bulk training, just getting the numbers through. And then I do some technical training, working on skills. And then I'd probably go off, stay at a friend's, have a few beers that night and um, relax and then try and catch competition somewhere in Sydney. If I wasn't in Sydney, I'd be doing very similar in Canberra, which also was four hours away. I'd stay down there with my parents. And then the other option for training would be to travel for a competition. So it's a two-day competition. I'd arrive on the Friday night. I might have travelled um, for eight hours for a competition one way then and compete all day for Saturday, all day Sunday, come back late Sunday night and start work. Now, if I was heading to, say, a World Championships or a World Cup, what I would do would be take probably five days just immediately before I flew out. And the first two days, I would just bulk train. So I would get hundreds and hundreds of targets under my belt so that I, my body had gone back into being used to the recoil and the gun fit. So it became automatic. The next day, I would do technical training, um, those skills that I needed to work on that maybe I'd noticed I'd had a floor in or um, I'd missed targets in during competition. And then the last two days before I flew out would be tapering. So having a mini competition and um, just not shooting as much as I needed to. The other thing was that if I was going to a country, say, uh, Peru, and I knew it was going to be 40 degrees and dry as over there, I would also try and find a place in Australia to train under those conditions if I could before I flew out. So I might fly out from Melbourne or Darwin or Perth, lots of options, and head off that way. The other thing was that if I didn't have a choice and I knew I was going to a dry place and I was going to be training in rain or snow in Australia or really cold weather, then I might forego the last couple of days training just because I didn't want to put errors into my tapering. Hmm. So I might just go, okay, I'll have a break and make sure that I do my tapering over there. So that was when I lived a long way away. After um, 2008, moved to Sydney, started up a business and just started getting lots of things back in my life because for my campaign from 2006 to 2008, it was all about shooting, just shooting, shooting, shooting. And I wasn't working. I was just totally focused on getting ready for, for Beijing. And so I moved to Sydney. I live 20, 15 minutes from a range. Actually, in, when I first moved, I was five minutes from the Sydney International Shooting Centre, which is where the Sydney Olympics were. And I would train five days a week. So I would pretty much... Um, do the proper skill training and work really hard and on technical perfection. I'd also make sure that I did pressure training as well. So I'd put myself under situations where if I dropped a target, I was going home. Or if I dropped a target, do 20 push-ups, that type of thing, trying to emulate a little bit of stress. And I'd, I'd also have um, people that I'd trained with and it'd be like, you know, one one shotgun cartridge it'd be like the bet for the round or so on and and so you were always trying to um, add a little bit of inspiration I also had chance to randomize the targets and make them variable and train in um, you know fast targets slow targets targets that weren't correctly presented um, so that again um, increased my skill set and my, my mental trace and memory of that skill improved. Um, and I was also close to sports psychologists and gyms and recovery sessions and, and lots of competition. So, um, yeah, I didn't have to travel as far, so I put more effort in. 
but I was also running a business as well. So I didn't get to travel to as many small competitions as I liked, but I spent a lot of time jumping on a plane and, and going somewhere else. Um, so yeah, when I didn't have a chance, it was like bulk training, technical, and then tapering. When I had a chance, it was sustained learning over a long period of time. Yeah. And one question that stands out is in that period where you could only train on the weekends, hypothetically, if you would have had the chance to train throughout the week, you think you could have been even better? Um, no, no. Um, I think, well, actually, technically, towards the end of my career, I was a better shooter. Um, because I'd learnt more, I'd been more interested in coaching and much more reflective. However, you can overtrain. You can just be bored with the task. And when I only trained on weekends, I put my all into that. And, and so the quality of the training was really high, whereas when I could train five days a week, sometimes I just... I have too long a lunch or something. Hmm. You have transitioned out of sport. How was the transition and what's going on in your life at this moment in time? Yeah, um, I was a very planned transition. I, so for 10, 12 years, I worked for the Department of Agriculture and I was a training and advisory specialist in invasive species. So things like feral pigs and foxes and rabbits and mice. So animals that have been introduced to Australia that aren't native, which just we hunt and we do things to. So I used to work with um, our government land bodies as well as private land bodies in learning to manage their land more uh, environmentally friendly and more sustainable. So that was my role then. And I'd retired from that in 2013, my last consultancy was then and so the 2012 campaign for London I was running my own business and doing a full-time consultancy so I was pretty busy and it worked out to be like you know a really productive thing for me busy people are effective people and I learned to be very good at time management after after London I wanted to become a coach. I'd been dabbling in coaching and I'd had coaches throughout my career who were good shooters but not necessarily great coaches. And then I had a couple of coaches, like my Athens coach, who was not the best shooter, not an Olympic level shooter, but was a really good people manager and a confident booster. And I kind of wanted more. I, I, I wanted our athletes to have the latest technical advice, the latest scientific advice. And I'd spent those 12 years as an educator and a training officer. I used to teach people how to shoot out of helicopters or um, to use cyanide and strychnine and things like that. So if I could teach um, rangers or farmers to do that, I can teach someone how to shoot. And so coaching or teaching is a, a relatively natural skill for me. Um, so I got my coaching accreditation skills nationally and then um, also internationally. Um, and it was a plan that when I retired, I would go into coaching full time. And I coached through my business hitting targets as well. So I've been lucky enough to take teams to World Cups and actually come away with team members with gold medals and and such so you know some some coaches can only dream of you know their athletes winning world cups and university games and stuff so I've, I've had a good run with that um for the last six years i have been the national coaching director head coach for the australian clay target association so not our olympic coach but the coach who looks after the main membership body so I did that for six years and uh, finished up in january and now i'm just trying to do my team building business better. I also work with the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, 
along with 38 other Olympic gold medalists from all disciplines and special forces commandos in preparing the next crop of Olympians from all disciplines to go to Tokyo. So that's an amazing program we have. And I'm learning heaps from that. And then I also work for the Australian Olympic Committee doing presentations to um, uh, 14 year old on average children that are thinking about their futures and just telling them, you know, be, be brave, find what you love and go for it. Um, so I keep myself pretty busy. I do motivational talks, a lot of coaching, and I also introduce my sport to corporations and others. So I, lo I love what I do. Really cool. Coming to the end of the interview, do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Okay, couple of questions. Have you interviewed a beach volleyball yet? Yes. Have you interviewed an Australian cyclist yet? No. Mm, road race? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to dob in Sarah. Oh, Karen sorry, sorry. Here. Yeah, I have, I have road racer, but not Australian. Ah, okay. Well, there's Sarah Carrigan, um, who I think I might dob in. Really cool. Australian uh, Olympic gold medalist from Athens. Really cool. Thank you. Where can people find you? Um, hittingtargets.com.au sure. Social media? Social media, same thing, hitting targets. Google Susie shooting, hitting targets, you'll find me. Really cool. Susie, thanks a lot for your time. That was awesome. Thanks, Christian. Nice interview and um, thank you.